Well, that's it. Arriving at the Khalakhali Lodge, five kilometers before before the Kalari Transfrontier Park, which is on on that side, and on that side is uh, Uppington, where we came from, Askam, um, and Andre as well. Arrived at the Turafiran Gate, staying at the lodge first day, so had excellent rain last night. A couple of rainbows out on the horizon on that side, and um, the cars are checking in from the lodge side. It opens up about 30 minutes to an hour later than the inside, uh, the people staying inside the park because we need to obviously enter via the outside gate over there. So we'll get our permits and then we get going. Okay, so we've received our entry permit, and basically, it is um, it's the goodie over there. It um, it requires the the driver's detail and the passenger's detail, and it controls access to the park. So, in other words, if we go for for a, a drive, uh, we leave the permit, and then they know exactly which vehicles have not returned, and then they could go and seek for them later on if something goes wrong and so on. So, let's jump in. Can we go? 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 So he's now registering the um, the permit number and uh, writing the name on the book. Um, we, he's entered the, the entry um, uh, time. And uh, they can also measure how far you've, how you've uh, driven. We go! And uh, we've just given him where we go. There's two routes that you go in. There's uh, the Nossop Road and the Mata Mata. Huh? Oh, it's not my man. Thank you. Thank you. So there are two routes or two main roads. Um, uh, the one going straight into Nosop, the Nosop River to the Nosop camp, and then there's the Alp River um, going to uh, Mata Mata camp. And what they want to know is, is which route you've taken because then they know if something goes wrong, if the car breaks down or there's an emergency, they could go on that specific route that you've got on the game drive. Very much easier in the Kalari. It's not like the the Kruger and other parks. Like I said, it's got this two um, roads going up to the north and there's a uh, dune roads that cross them, cross section. Okay, here, going to close down. You can see the, there's the distances to the camp and then you've got the times um, that you need to be back times that the gates open and the gates close and you need to adhere to that very strictly because they find you quite heavily. Um, we're inside now and the other side far over there on the horizon is the is the Botswana side of Tuerofiran, the camp. In the center here is the border between South Africa and Botswana. There's no fence up there and it's it's a transfrontier park so there's no um, there's no um, restriction, you know, if we enter into the park, then um, then you can, you, from time to time, you can cross over into the Botswana side, and then you need to come back out on the on the same side, South African side, once you've entered in here. If you enter in the Botswana side, you can uh, zigzag across into South Africa because the roads actually go through; they zigzag through the country, the two countries, Botswana and South Africa, down the Nosop River. So here we go. Here's the the actual camp's gate. With a speed limit clearly at 50 over there and this gate needs to be opened in the morning sometimes the lines lie right here and the staff is too scared to open it up quite rightly so and here we are flat bed it's called the uh, Nosop River it's the Molopo Molopo River and it becomes the Nosop River um, where the confluence is of the Nosop and the Aub just a few kilometers down here first water roll is right there so everyone tend to miss it because it's too close to the camp and everyone wants to go as far as possible. Um, we're the first in today of the lodge visitors, but the guys in the park itself has been in for quite some time, or half an hour I think, uh, they've been in. The times of the gates are um, set according to the sunset, so they make sure that you don't drive in the dark. 
um, and it's uh, as the seasons fluctuate they will open the gates earlier or later as, as long as there's enough light to open so let's let's see what we get So we are between Rippets and KK and uh, some nice interaction there. You got the chanting goshawk over here. It, uh, it looks like he's young and uh, he's killed a little snake and he's obviously shot it and you can see how protective he is with his with his wings towards the small one. He doesn't want to share his meal with his youngster. So. Um, Quite prolific, and um, normally they hunt with the with the badgers and stuff. If you see a couple of them in a treetop, you'd know that they're hunting with the badgers. Um, it's a small little snake. I don't know what snake it is. There's a mongoose it was coming out towards the chanting goshawk because it wanted to steal its um, its its prey they, they normally interact either the um, the mongoose come for their prey or, or the other way around um, and the youngster chased off the the mongoose while the mother or the father was eating along so the red mongoose is still underneath there it doesn't like to be in the close proximity of the mongoose Okay, there was there was something um, on this very quiet morning, rainy morning. A lot of vultures, um, a lot of vultures that we normally see after the rain in the puddles next to the road. They tend to wash, they tend to bathe and eat the insects that come with the rain and so on. So that was um, something to just check whether the cameras are still working. The water and the road and that's why there's a lot of raptors around because all of the butterflies and and some of the insects come out even one day after after the rain so and in front here we've got two tortoises that's mating a video clip of the tortoises mating so when you see the the video it won't be in slow motion that's actual real time <laughs> and they seem to pop out one of the first animals that pop out prolifically after after any rain because uh, as you can imagine they're quite slow and they can't get to water that quickly and they don't drink a lot but i mean they they you see them they're one of the most prolific animals along the riverbed especially after it's rained or after some of the first small or, or um, young green leaves and shrubs are coming out. They're moving towards the road, so we're gonna give them we're gonna give them some space. As you can see those butterflies also come out prolifically after the rain, the next day after the rain. And then they suck up any moisture that they get, even in the very dry periods, if line urine urinate or, or any other antelope they would they would um, fly for it and try and get every piece of moisture that they can out of the 
the soil so you can see they don't go into the water which is just here here's the water right here they go to the muddy area about um, 40 centimeters away So that's a nice introductory trip. Um, everything is not yet packed, unpacked. We just grabbed a, a camera and a GoPro and, and uh, X, the iPhone X, to uh, to capture what is uh, what is there. Very quiet trip going there. Turned around at Markflay, and then it was a bit better. Um, it's getting a bit warmer now. It's still overcast, and I think we might get some rain tonight again. So we're heading back to the lodge. To unpack the trailer and um, and some of uh, hand over some of the enlargements and um, mounted photos that we brought for the lodge to be displayed in the gallery over there. Uh, we um, to the filling. You can see the chalets in the back there, and also the fuel station where you can fill up. And there's also and uh, deflate or. Get your tires ready for you for the tar road because the tar road is just in front here. The campsite and the day visitors are supposed to be here. You can see where they're sitting over there. Day visitors, just because people come up from the north, they come to the camp over there, turn around, have the um, lunch or, or brunch, and then go back to to the camps in the northern side of the park. And this is the campsite over here. Really getting a bit busier because it's school holidays a bit busier than when we were here a month ago so yeah let's check out and in the permit or get the permit and then go to the lodge so this is the start of our new project at the Khalakhadi Lodge just in front of the um, Khalakhadi Trans Frontier Park over there we've, um, we've uh, collaborated with SJ the owner of the Khalakhadi Lodge and we're making it a photographic theme. This is done so that we we um, highlight the photographer and the photographer's role in conservation in places like, for instance, the, the, the South African parks and all other parks. And um, and uh, so this is we themed it camel thorn reception area um, with the camel thorn trees out there, camel thorn uh, bench. It's going to be a reception. So um, let's get in the car and see what Alma's doing with the meerkat. What Alma is doing is, is uh, she gathers meerkat from all over the country. I know Professor Anne Rasa has been uh, quite well known with, with um, meerkat reared on the Kalari Road. But Alma is also registered and it's, it's quite an issue because she must drive to, to the out or the corners of South Africa to collect a meerkat that's been um, kept in captive as, as, uh, as pets. They've got a very scientific way of keeping the the um, meerkat together. There's some of them that's too aggressive. So what will what will happen is they'll take the the meerkat from uh, one of these two enclosures and then uh, load them in the and the bucky. They're loading the the frame of the cage that they're going to release the meerkat in. Uh, it's one of the one of the more beautiful forms in the area. And what we we're doing here is is they putting up the cage and then digging a hole so that the cage is, is a bit sunken. They dig themselves out and then they go back into the hole and that's sort of a protection for them until they, they start roaming and um, find out whether there's other colonies and, and determine a new territory. The kids of Johan is, uh, is uh, very interested in, in getting involved and what a nice thing because there's a huge education of the kids as well with the meerkat that's been released. I'd like this message to probably get all over the world because the meerkat it's stolen and exploited all over the world as a pet. And what happens is it's too aggressive and the people just leave them, they kill them and they do all sorts of funny things like pulling all their teeth, chopping off their tails to tame them, etc. So yeah, what, what they do is, is they, they, um, uh, they, they put the cage and then they, they would later on dig out. As a matter of fact, today they will dig them out. But let's hear what, what Alma says about, about um, the release and about the meerkat in general. In the enclosures, we put out um, kitten pellets. It's a very concentrated and well-balanced 
kit and pellet. That's all we supply for them to force them to start searching for food. We do find that they struggle sometimes to find food in the beginning. Um, they will dig a whole day and find nothing because they do not know where to find the food. But that, um, as they stay in the fall, that gets better and they eventually stop eating the pellets and that's when we take it away and we take the enclosure away. What are their predators? Uh, why are they um, so scarce these days? Is it mostly humans, or is it natural conditions as well? Um, with well, the, the trade has made a big difference in their numbers, but we also find that there are nat diseases that now is now um, killing quite a few colonies, and then also. Um, we think that uh, poison that we put out in carcasses for for other predators like jackal and, and caracal um, has also killed quite a lot of meerkats in the felt because they will go to a carcass and they will eat from it. Uh, okay, tell us, um, how, how do you actually survive? I mean, I see you've been driving with vehicles and you're collecting meerkats from all over South Africa. Um, and you've got the rehabilitation center and you're driving out here in your cages. Have you got any sponsors or do you need any sponsors? At the moment we are really in dire need of sponsors. Um, we do get people that make donations, um, but it's not a constant every month donation that comes in. So we do struggle to survive sometimes. Um, and you know, the meerkats, the food is expensive, extremely expensive. The medical cost is very high. We, our closest vet is 180 kilometers from us. Um, so, you know, and we've only got one vehicle, which makes it very dif difficult um, because we, we need to travel. We travel up to the Western Cape. We've traveled down to Natal to fetch meerkats and we can't always do it together um, because we need a hands on at the center and that does, you know, make a problem for us to, to do our job. The farmers around in this area is uh, take responsibility over the meerkat, um, like Johan Reinecke is from, from Ascom. And uh, um, uh, let's, let's hear why Johan actually um, gets involved releasing the meerkat on his farm. Johan, I see you, you've, you've, as a farmer and a businessman, you've decided to, to rescue this um, group of meerkats and release them on your farm. Um, why would you do that? Is there a need for meerkat? Um, what's the reason? Well, we, we tend to see there's a decrease in, in population of the meerkats um, and that is something that is really worrying. Uh, you don't see them in the field anymore as much as, as in our young, younger days. What do you think is the, the cause over here, Johan, in, in a felt like this close to areas of Askam and the entrance to the Kalari, why, to the park, why, why would they get less? It's a known fact that the local people sell them for extra money. Um, you can't really blame them. I think it's more people buying them that, that's causing the market for this. But, but yeah, it, it's, it's because of people catching them and selling them to tourists. So, Johan, is there, is there, is there a, a need for, for releasing meerkat like this on farmers? In other words, if we approach other farmers to do that, uh, is, it, is it good for the environment? Is it... Yeah, I, I really think so. I th I, you, you will see there's an there's a imbalance in the, in the ecosystem. Find more mice and all of that. That's, it's the, the, um, yeah, it's good for the, for the ecotourism and, and, and the balance in, in the ecotourism. And you, uh, this is also a guest house, Johan, a guest farmer, is it right? Yes, yes. Yeah, What's it called? Uh, Mari, Mari Guest Mari Guest, and, yeah. and on what road are you? Where are you? It's on the R31 uh, Fansel's Res Askam Road, about 12 kilometers from Askam.